pleased to be here with us as part of a day where we're understanding, trying to understand how America changes. What are the things that allow us to become a better country? What are the ways artists help us re-envision in America? And so in a way, I want to talk a lot about your work and you, uh, but I wonder if we could start by just maybe having you help us think about as an artist, as a filmmaker, what do you see your role in a time like this when we're worried about Black Lives Matter, we think about Ferguson? Um, what does it mean to you? How does it shape the way you think about the work you do? Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Whenever I walk out, I always am surprised that people are here. Um, <laughs> I really am. Um, you know, every artist is different, you know, um, I think it's all about intention and, and what you intend to do as an artist, and for me, I'm, I'm really looking to say something with my work. Um, not to say that an artist that's not looking to, you know, say something is, is less or it's just different, a different, a different uh, point of view about what the work means. For me, I'm trying to create a canon of work, uh, a body of work that really um, uh, says one thing, um, that Black Lives Matter. Uh, that, you know, just amplifying the mechanisms of who we are, the complexity of who we are, not always positive, not always negative, but complex, um, a comprehensive view. So that's, you know, really what I hope in the end all of the work will say. Um, but also, you know, I directed episode of Scandal, and that just said, Terry Washington is bad, and she's <laughs> fantastic, and we love that. And that's also saying something just in her fat fabulousness. So I think, you know, um, it's, it's a relegate artists to have to do one thing or another. It's into tricky territory. I, I uh, you know, I'm not above doing something just for fun. Uh, but, but overall, with the, with the film work, most especially, um, because that's it's so rigorous and it's so, you know, all-consuming. You know, that really I can't see myself working on something that doesn't really mean something to my heart. Yeah. Well, then let's talk a little bit about um, some of your work because what struck me is I've thought a lot about how you um, try to make sure you're doing complete depictions of the African American experience, the people you do. Um, but I was struck by something, I want you to tell me if this is right, that when you first looked at the script for Selma, for example, that there really weren't many roles for women, uh, speaking roles in that, and that did you sort of restructure that so that you could make sure that women were fully dimensionalized? Oh, yeah, it was a page one rewrite, so everything, it was, it was completely rewritten from what was there. But yes, I mean, originally it was very relegated to uh, uh, King and Johnson and their escapades in the White House, very much leaning towards Johnson. Um, and I was just more interested in what was happening in, in it was called Selma, so we should probably just go to Selma. So, you know, very much keeping it in, in, in you know, what, what was happening in the black community's response to it. And then also just the shades, the different variations of how black folk were responding within the movement, that we were not a monolith, that everyone didn't just line up behind King and lockstep and do what he wanted, that there was, you know, a difference of opinion, a difference of ideas, a difference of, um, you know, in, in a thought about how to pursue it. And it was really interested in the strate strategic endeavor that it was, just showing black people thinking about how to solve this problem and what to do and how to, 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 to kind of come to consensus on these ideas. So that was what I went in wanting to do just from what I found interesting about, about the movement in that time and, and just try to insert as much black liberation theory as I can before people know this and like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I, still, I still marvel that I got a couple things in. Like, I still, I don't think people, I think people get wrapped up, or luckily I think some of the folks on the Hollywood kind of corporate side listening to a couple of things, like when Lorraine Toussaint and Carmen Jogo as Amelia Boynton and Mrs. King are walking down the path to go see Malcolm X. I mean, she, I have them say, she's saying some things. <laughs> um, at the very end of the speech, when, um, you know, I, I approximate King's idea of, you know, the vicious lie, you know, the lie that controlled the lie of racism and just, you know, some of the most radical, revolutionary kind of jaw-dropping things that he said. Um, and just kind of crammed them all in that final speech. But you're just, you're watching David and you're seeing everything and you're just like, this feels good. And maybe I was able to flip a couple things through. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I think, I think, you know, for me in that film, you know, it was, um, you know, taking what was there, which was a different point of view about Selma mm -hmm. and making it into, into what I thought was most important. And that just speaks to the, you know, importance of different voices and different perspectives about, about these historical events. I mean, um, the writer who eventually got the credit for my script um, lives. <laughs> <laughs>
it's made it for the mind. You know what I mean? I mean, the, 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 the lens through which we, we survey these things is, is really should be up to grabs, and there should up for grabs, and there should be one way. Um, I should be able to bring myself to this history and talk about the things that are important to me within the context of Selma, which is what, which is what we did. Well, in a way, um, I mean, I, 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 don't, I, want to, I don't want to just focus on Selma, but I want to ask one more Selma question. Sure. And that is, I think a lot of us were moved to tears in profound ways um, at the scene on the Birmingham 16th Street Baptist Church. Right. Um, yeah. Could you talk a little bit about the choices you made to do that and why to do it and how you did it in such a way um, that was both poignant and powerful? Yeah, thank you. That, that was one of the first orders of business in the rewrite was to, um, you know, really try to put people in, you know, the terrorist state of, you know, uh, you know, the Deep South and the mid-60s, uh, you know, the five in time. I really always talk about this allergy that I have towards other civil rights films that really, civil rights films that really, you know, it's kind of lit with supermarket lighting and like, you know, everyone's, it's going to be okay in the end and, you know, everyone's just, you know, striving for something, but you don't see the violence, it's a very violent time. And that was just one order of business business that I and my key collaborators had was just to really, you know, um, illustrate the violence. So you put, you put right there and you then, you know, engage with the narrative in a more, <clears throat> in a more meaningful, emotional way. I think to, to <clears throat> negate the violence that this, these heroic, heroic acts were, were, um, you know, uh, were committed against, you know, is to, is to negate the power of what they did. I mean, you know, it's, it's much harder to, 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 you know, engage in protest when you know, there's real, real true fear of death and no protection. And so to, to, to try to tell the story without putting me right there just made no sense to me. So for me, just in the research, and, and, and of course, we all know, um, you know, when you read all of the movement history and everyone's autobiographies, they talk about the seminal moment of the, of the Birmingham bombing and what a turning point that was. It was a point of no return. It really created a schism in some of the groups in terms of how to approach it. I mean, it was, you know, a point when they are, all started to, to really interrogate what they were doing and why and how to move forward. And so even though that's 1964 in Birmingham, I thought it was a, you know, perfect entree into putting the audience in the right frame of mind to continue on. Um, and so yes, you know, in constructing that, and thinking about the four little girls of what we know, there's only five little girls. Um, and, you know, what could they have been talking about as, as young girls, you know, during that time? So I called my mom, um, who was born in 1954, who was around the same age as the girls, and I asked her, what did you think about those talk about uh, back in 1964? She's like, I don't think it's what girls talk about. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, and about like 11 years old, hair, and starting to take care of yourself, and care about the way that you look, and just kind of wanting to emulate, you know, your, your older sister and all that good stuff. And so she also, in this conversation, phone conversation I had with her, because she lives in Montgomery, Alabama, started talking about how they regarded Coretta Scott King. And, um, and she said, you know, she was like the Beyonce of the time. 